Good morning. We're going to learn about peace today. And hey, Chris, welcome back. That's actually the, the title of today's message is Peace, Be Still. So I was looking at um, what God kind of guided me to write, and it's a lot. So I may have to go kind of quick and read quickly. So. We'll just get started, but first I just want to thank you, God, for allowing me to be up here, and here I am, so I'm here to represent you, and I want everybody here to see you today, so get me out of the way and let your Holy Spirit just guide this message completely. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So we're going to learn about peace, but we, in order to do that, we need to go back to the beginning. And that starts in Genesis. And we learn that we had perfect peace with God in the garden and with each other, with nature. Everything was exactly the way that God intended it. But we disobeyed God, and we ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and that caused some problems. So in Genesis 2, 16 through 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So what is death in, in this context is separation from God. And that's what we created when we disobeyed. It was a spiritual death occurred. So if our, our spirit is dead, then by default, we're slaves to these bodies that we're in. We answer to them and we fulfill its needs, which is completely out of order with what God intended. Paul describes what we're like when our spirit was dead in Christ. In Titus 3, verse 3 through 7, he says, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So when our spirit's dead, that's what we look like. But... When the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, which was Jesus, not by works of righteousness, but which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That's the good news, is we see what we look like when our spirit's dead, but the good news is that Jesus came and with the Holy Spirit breathed life into us and our spirit awakes. So back to the garden, when Satan, the liar and deceiver, he came in in the form of a serpent to tempt us into eating from the tree and we failed miserably. And we're going to read a lot of Genesis here because God's showing me it's important to have our, our roles defined. So bear with me, I'll, I'll try to go through this real quick, but it starts Genesis 3 verse 1 through 24. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in that day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. 
Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, here comes God, in the cool of day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. <laughs> and the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. She shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then he said to, Ad, then to Adam, he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust and to dust you shall return. And Adam called, to, called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living things. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Whew. So there are some roles, and I mean, what a story. That's our beginning. That's our origin and who we are, and it, it's all right there. So, in order to have peace, we need to know who we are. And that's what this says right here, is knowing God. That's our source of peace. The story is not over. That's the beginning. There is also a middle and an end. And God reminds us of the end many times. And I, I want to go to John 24, 35 through 39. For comfort, because that beginning doesn't sound so good. We're kind of off to a rocky thing. But heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the, son, will the coming of the Son of Man be. So he is on his way back shortly. And we need to prepare ourselves. And again, to do that, we need to know who we are and not be deceived. So God's nature God's trials and God's promises are all sources of peace for us who are in God and in his spirit. And they can only be realized through that personal relationship with him. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they all work together as one to accomplish this. So again, who are we in the context of this relationship? In Genesis 1.27 
So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. (sighs) We were made in the image of God. We are kings and queens of eternity. We're his children, his heirs to eternity. That's who we are in the context of this relationship. We need to know that. We were created for his good pleasure, not because he was like lonely and needed somebody, but we were made out of love. So he sent us out of the garden at that point, but that's when our redemptive love story began, as soon as we left. And we, without God, we tried to create a peace in the world that's based on worldly things like families, friendships, relationships, personal success, how much money we have, all these things that we, we put confidence in because it gives us a sense of peace. It's, this is who we are. It's comforting. I'm good at this. I have a lot of money. If something happens, I'm, I'm going to be fine. And we have these great plans and we find peace, you know, through these sunny days and relaxing and through drugs and alcohol, some of us run to to find peace in a million other ways. But if we're finding peace in the worldly things, it's temporary and it doesn't last because it can end at any moment. They can be taken. And with that, so will be your peace. It's gone. Now what? Peace from God is different because it's eternal and it's not based on this world. And because of that, anything in the world can be taken, and you'll still have your peace. So that's what we rely on when we're in Christ, is his peace, and that everything else can fall apart, but that will remain. Our worldly peace is like sandcastles, and they can be beautiful, and you can spend hours and days, and I've seen some on our beaches that are amazing. But when the tiniest little wave comes, it's gone. The tiniest little wave, and it's gone. But God is the rock, and the biggest waves can crash against him, and it will not move. And instead, it gets smooth, and it's refined. So it's becoming better than it was. That's our God, and that's who we are. That's how he made us to be. In Titus 1, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. So everything he says, everything in the Bible is a promise. Everything. Our promises in our flesh are are not the same. I mean, we make promises all the time that we break. And even the the well-meaning ones, I promise I'll be there on time. I promise I'll be there for you. And then we break it immediately. Our Our promises can be flippant, but God's aren't. He never, ever, ever fails with what he says he's going to do. And when we're in him, when we know him, that's who we are. We can identify with that. And the closer that I've gotten to know God, I've, I've noticed how much less I speak. Because that's who God is in us. We don't just blabber about plans and things that we don't know about. He wants us to speak the truth and speak promises. So finding peace in God's promise, we're going to go to Acts 22, 17 through 22. Now it happened. This is Paul the Apostle who was a a Christian hater. Now he's a, a gospel crusader. And he's in Jerusalem. He says, now... It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. So they like 
everything that Paul was saying up until the point where he tells him he's going to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. And suddenly they want to kill him. So they throw him into prison, and they're so hungry to kill Paul that they fast. And they make a pact not to eat or drink anything until they kill him. In Acts 23, 11, here's God showing up. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And that's a promise. That's a God who cannot lie. So Paul's in prison, and he tells him this. So Paul knows that he's going to make it to Rome. No matter what happens, he's going to make it there. So they're telling me they're going to kill me, but you're telling me this. I don't know how, but I'm going to make it to Rome. And he carries this promise out of that prison cell. They end up releasing him, and they don't kill him. But he keeps that same promise through many, many future beatings, stonings, death sentences. All through his life, it's marked by these things. But this promise stays and remains, and he does make it to Rome. And Paul carried that with him. And the beatings and the imprisonments were not pleasant. He's not cheering for these things, saying, bring it on. God said, I'm going to Rome, so... Go ahead and try to kill me. Let's see what you got. We don't cheer for these kinds of things either. But with God's promises, we can stand on and go through them. And like we, we just saw, everything he says is a promise. And he calls us his children, heirs to eternity, to the eternal throne in heaven. That's kind of a big deal. My sister, Brenda, um, when she was seven years old, she had the, uh, uh, <sighs> she had the flu, but it wouldn't go away. So my mom took her to the hospital, and the doctors couldn't figure out why until they scanned her, and they found a big lump of uh, brain cancer. And, the, you know, we don't have a history or anything like that. And she's seven years old. And as a parent, now, to my daughter, I mean, taking that news was be earth-shattering. Um, and it was from my mom. In um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And my mom learned what that meant uh, while she was in the hospital. And the devil came to her and was taunting her and saying, where's your God? Look at your, your precious little girl. And she's dying from brain cancer right in front of your eyes. She's blind. She's terrified. Where's your God? Why doesn't he heal her? And she wrestled with this all night. And God finally came in at the end and gave her peace. And he told her that I'm taking your daughter, which he did. She died the next morning. And it was devastating. But my mom is praying, um, There's there were six of us, Emily, Alicia, Becky, Stephanie, Brenda, and Michael, my little boy. But she asked God, just make my kids a, a blessing for you. Let them bless you. And God spoke to her heart and said, I will. And they're going to know me. And we all do. And we're, we've all been saved through Jesus Christ. It's pretty awesome, really. It's a miracle. But God promised, and he fulfills. And that's something she had to carry because I can tell you it didn't look like that was going to happen at all. I mean, me and my sisters were wild and out of control, skipping school, 
Some of my sisters were running away to go watch New Kids on the Block. And it's gone on a train to California from Seattle. They're like 16, 17, 18. I was just, it didn't look like these things were going to happen, you know. But that's a God promise. In the end, it does. And some of the years were terrifying. Just <laughs> terrifying. But God doesn't see it like that. To him, he knows exactly what's going to happen. He already knows. We can also find peace through God's nature. And we find that Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41, when he's teaching at the Sea of Galilee. It says, On that same day, after he's teaching, when the evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. And when they left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who can this be is the prince of peace? He is showing us his nature. This isn't a trial. They're not going through a trial. He's using this to show us who he is. It's not about the storms of our life and what we go through. He's, he wants to use this to show his nature to us. And we have to keep in mind who he is. If we are with him, is who we are. So in showing us his nature, he's also showing us our own nature. And that's why he asks, how do you have no faith? If you're in me, this is who I am, the Prince of Peace. Accept it. You need to accept who you are. So he's not looking for peace because he is the peace. And because he is, we are. That's our relationship. Is everything that he is, we are. So if he's peace and we carry him, then we carry his peace. Our natural habitat is dwelling with God. That's where we're meant to be. Until we're doing that through a personal relationship with him, we won't have that peace, and there will always be unrest. When the waves come, we're ready to jump off the boat. But with him, we're not ready to go anywhere. We can be asleep on a pillow, just like him. Can you imagine that? In this huge storm, and he's <laughs> cozy on a pillow? I mean, I've been picturing that in my head. I'm like, that's our God, you know? He's taken away all of our sin, the original sin in the garden, through his son, Jesus. That was our peace pact with God. And that's what made it possible for us to accept our inheritance, which is eternal life and direct access to God. So when we accept him, we're accepting all these things. We're accepting who we truly are. In John 14, verses 15 through 20, he says, this is Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. That's the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be, with you, be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will, come to see, I will come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. So Jesus is talking here before his death, before his, his crucifixion, not his death. Because he does not die, and because of that, neither do we. At that day, you will know 
that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. And the Bible goes over and over and over again about the context of our relationship. That we're one. We were made in his image. We're meant to be one with the Father. And that I've heard a lot of this so many times, but the last few days, God revealed some things to my spirit about what that really means. Because you can read these things, and it, it's just words. Until the, the Holy Spirit reveals what these words actually mean, they're just words. But he showed me we are sons and daughters of God. That's I mean, it, it kind of was mind-blowing when that concept reached my spirit. And, I mean, I'm, I'm still in shock that that's who we are. That's who he created us to be. He made us like him. God sees and knows the whole picture. And we see in parts... And the Bible confirms this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9 through 12. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part but then I shall know just as I also am known. In our relationship with him, he slowly takes back the veil and shows us who he is the more we walk with him. And again, we're his offspring, his eternal creatures that he created for his good pleasure. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Verse 2 through 3, he shows us who we are again through Paul. Do you know, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? This is who we are. The saints will judge the world. He's given us all his authority, everything. He's given us everything. We need to accept it if we really want to have a covenant relationship with our creator. We need to accept that it's not because we're worthy, because he made us this way. It's not by works of righteousness or anything that we've done to deserve it. He made us this way. Peace can be found through trials. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, Paul writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because... The love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So in trials, we're getting to know God more. He's not putting us through things in vain or for some kind of sick joke to see how much we can take. He's doing it to draw us closer to him into a deeper relationship. And we all have plans in life, and we all want good. We want good things. Um, I'm sure we all know who Mike Tyson is. <laughs> I love Mike Tyson. He's, there's nobody else like him. He said in, a, in an interview, his mentor and trainer, people are just trying to train against him and learn how to beat him. And he said, everyone has a plan. Until they get punched in the face. <laughs> then all of a sudden, you got Mike Tyson chasing you around a little boxing ring, and you're running for your life, and your plan you, is gone. 
And um, I like that a lot. And I, I like the way Mike Tyson speaks because I, I think I sound very odd, my speaking voice. But when he says face, it sounds like he's saying faith. So that made me think of the correlation with the, the context of, of this message is that we get punched in the faith, you know? <laughs> and so, so did Job. He got punched in the faith pretty hard. In chapter 1, verse 6 through 12, is how this begins. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And he's about to lose everything. But do you really know somebody until you've gone through a difficult time with them? If you have friends or relationships or family members where it's all been light and good and just blessings, everything's great. Those are easy relationships to maintain because there's nothing wrong. But who are they and who are you when everything falls apart and some of these people who made promises are gone and they want nothing to do with you? Um, some of them, you know, are going to cause even more problems for you through your hardship. But you, you learn these things through the trial you're learning. So I want to point out real quick in Isaiah 55, verse 8 through 9, before we talk more about Job, because we need to know this before we go any further. In Isaiah 55, uh, verse 8 through 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we have to keep that in mind for what Job is about to go through. Because he loses his health, wealth, and all his children. Seven sons and three daughters. Dead. Everything he owned, and he was rich. It's gone. And eventually he loses his health when he's covered in these painful boils. Or he can't sit down. His breath gets foul smell. His wife doesn't want anything to do with him. It's all gone. And these were days where God blessed you if you were an upright man. And we heard he was an upright man. He was spotless, blameless in God's eyes. So he had these blessings in physical form. And in those days, that's what God required. He said, carry out my will and I'll bless you. That's what Job did. So what's going on? Why is this happening? If I'm a good man and everything was right, I just lost everything. And this leads him on a search for the truth of why this happened. Because if he was a bad person, that would kind of make sense. And this is kind of the way that we think, too, is if we're not doing so good, with maybe we're, we're gambling or we're doing things we feel like we shouldn't, Something comes along that's unpleasant. It makes sense. I was like, okay, maybe I deserve that. But if you're blameless in God's eyes, how could this happen? So he asks his good friends to come along, and they come along, and they tell him, it's your fault. It's all your fault. Why this is happening? And, and if not that, then it's your children. 
your ten dead children that just died. It's their fault. And this is not very sensitive. I mean, if you th- really think about this in, uh, in terms of reality, I mean, how would you respond to your, your best friend saying that to you? And even his wife, she doesn't want anything to do with him. And she's telling him you should curse God. Why would he do this? It doesn't make any sense. But it leads him to come closer to God. And Job actually is being blessed through this because God is drawing him closer. That's the blessing is that he searches his friends for truth and he doesn't find any. Then he searches his own heart for truth. There's none there to be found either. So finally, he turns to God and he starts kind of barking at him. He's not happy. And in fact, he wishes he was never born. He regrets that he even exists. And eventually, God is heard enough and he shows up in Job 38, verses 4 through 7. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And now Job is standing face to face in front of God. And God goes down this list of questions, hundreds, a uh, hundred and something questions, and they're all geared to show Job who he is, that he's bigger than what your thinking is in this situation. And I like the way that he um, brings up the ostrich in Job 39, verses 13 through 18. He says, the wings of the ostrich wave proudly, But are her wings and pinions like the kindly storks? For she leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without concern because God deprived her of wisdom and did not endow her with understanding. When she lifts her head on high, she scorns the horse and its rider. And I I thought that was really interesting, just the ostrich, just picturing, why would he reference an ostrich, you know? And they're, they're so mean. And he's telling him he made them with these huge wings, but they can't fly. Why would I do that? And she is so like a horrible parent. She leaves her eggs on the ground, just kind of kicks a little dust over them and goes away. So other animals come by and crush them. And a lot of them get stolen. There's only uh, 15% of the eggs actually hatch because she's a horrible parent. And then when they're born, she's mean, you know? It's like, (laughs) why would I do this, Job? He's making all these points and you don't know. And, And that's okay that you don't know. I'm not pointing this out to say, Look how dumb you are. Look how smart I am. I'm showing you this because my thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm seeing the whole picture. You're seeing in part. So the focus shouldn't be on why are these things happening. It should be on me the whole time. So this is the blessing, is that he's pulled him into this relationship that just got really deep. And James talks about Job in chapter 5, verse 7 through 11. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it it, until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren... Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we, do, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the, the end intended by the Lord and that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. And we know 
later in Job, he gave him everything back. He gave him kids back. He doubled, actually. In fact, he doubled everything Job had. And the kids in heaven, he also gave him kids on earth. So he knew this was going to happen. The whole point was to draw him closer to him into a deeper and stronger relationship. And that's what gave Job his peace. In John 14, 1 through 6, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how, we, how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So through Jesus is our redemption, our relationship with God with, to get our peace back is restored when we claim that. And that's what Job got back at the end was his peace. He got everything else back, but that, that wasn't the real blessing. The blessing was that he now knows God. Before he said, I've heard you, but by the end he says, now I've seen you. And I think a lot of us experience that with God is that we can, we can read this Bible from cover to cover, but until the Spirit reveals the truth to us, it's just words. And we can hear it and kind of gloss over it. But when you experience it, you, <laughs> you can't unsee it. You know now. You've heard it before, but you're going to know it. And that's what he invites us into. Job didn't hear the conversation that God was having with the devil. He didn't know any of that. He didn't know that thousands of years later we're going to be talking about him as a reference for peace. But God did. He sees the whole thing. So all of our confidence, all of our peace, all of our trust, everything is contingent on this. And that goes beyond this church. It goes into your heart. It's a personal thing. And it, it's awesome to come here and gather and worship and be with you guys. And uh, I've learned the value of that in the last four years. I stopped going to church for about 20 years. But my personal relationship with God did not. But coming here and seeing it's a luxury, you know. I mean, I have my personal relationship. Nothing's going to change that. But being able to share that with each other is what God intended. And we, we are the sons and daughters of God. We're one. We're not separate. We look separate, but we're one. And we need to claim that. That's part of our peace. So I just want, I mean, that's my heart. That's where God wanted me to deliver to you today is that truth. And I, I just ask God that you penetrate our hearts with your message today and take that veil back and show us our true nature and let us be defined by you only, not the things in this earth for comfort and peace, but in you. And let us be one in you and carry that with us today and let that seed continue to grow that you're planting in the hearts of people that you brought here today to hear this. I just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for letting me be a part of your message. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.